This week, we have a story about two men who are probably among the most vicious and sadistic serial killers in American history and who you likely never heard of. They terrorized the pioneers crossing the Appalachian Mountains on the way to new lands in the West, in Indiana, Illinois, and beyond. Hello, folks. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and this is Stories, A History of Appalachia. Be sure to go down below and click that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Ding the bell to get notified for all the stories that we have as as they come out. And uh, be sure to give us one of these, too, okay? I'll tell you, we, we just keep on finding more things that just makes Appalachia that much more interesting or that much wondering, scratching your head, wondering how in the world did this happen. But you said serial killers. Mm-hmm. Wow. That kind of just jumps out at you because you think to yourself, now, aren't serial killers kind of modern day and things? But no, not in this case. They are not modern day and they were pioneer serial killers and they were... The roughest of the rough, I guess, if you want to call it that. Well, these folks would give anybody else a run for their money. Uh, They were absolutely, and I'm not kidding, probably the most vicious serial killers this country has ever seen. Whoa. And the story of these folks begins with the arrival of two Scots immigrants who came to America in 1759, John and William Harper. Now, these brothers had two sons. Micaiah Harp, born between 1760 and 1768, we're not exactly sure when, and Wiley Harp, same thing, born sometime between 1765 and 1770. The men settled with their families in frontier North Carolina in Orange County. Now, this group, unlike most frontier settlers, sided with the Tories, or Loyalists, in the Revolution. The older men fought at Kings Mountain for the British, After Kings Mountain, Patriot regulators seized their property and belongings, along with that of other Tory families, intent on driving them out of the Carolinas. And the parents were either killed or fled, and the boys were left on their own to their own devices. Makaja and Wiley, or as they were better known, Big Harp and Little Harp, respectively, and that's what we will refer to them throughout this podcast, They went into the wilderness, living on their wits and living in caves or living in the woods, and they were stealing, getting by on what they could catch or forage for, all right? But they joined the Cherokee against the Patriot settlers in the early 1780s in raids sponsored by the British on Western settlements, including the Battle of Blue Licks on August 19, 1782. Now, these raids included not just theft— But this, rape, murder, and, for lack of a better term, wanton destruction of settlers' property, anything and everything they wanted to destroy. Well, in 1781, in June of that year, the men kidnapped two women in North Carolina, Maria Davidson and Susan Wood, and took them across the mountains to what would later become Tennessee, raping and brutalizing them every step of the way. And, Rod, they spent the next 12 years living among the Cherokee with the women held captive. Davidson and Wood became pregnant twice, and twice the Harps killed their own children. Why did they do that? I'm just I'm just asking that right off. I mean, that just makes no sense to it whatsoever. Just excess baggage? What was it? They were mean. I mean, that's all you can say. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that is, but I mean, I just, you know, that's just kind of crazy, you know, but they are crazy. I, there's no other better way to say it. Uh, I told you, these are probably the most vicious serial killers the country's ever seen. Wow. Well, while with the offshoot band of the Cherokee, the Chickamauga, the Harps fought with Chief John Watts in the attack on Buchanan Station near Nashboro, now Nashville, almost wiping out the settlement in 1792. In 1794, Major James Orr led a counterattack on the Cherokee town of Nickajack near Chattanooga, but the Harps, possibly warm by their white contacts, had slipped out the night before the attack, saving their lives. During the rest of 1794 and 1795, the men, along with Maria Davidson and Susan Wood, moved up into and pillaged and foraged in the Lee County, Virginia, and Claiborne County, Tennessee portions of Powell Valley. 
You know, another thing that amazes me about this story so far, Mm -hmm. this is after the Revolutionary War. Oh, yeah. We thought everything else was okay, but here in Appalachia, the fighting was still ongoing between loyalists and, and, you know, the people that were trying to make ends meet and trying to do something on the frontier. But it's just unreal. But in 1795, or I should say by 1795, the men arrived in the territorial capital of Knoxville moving on to a farm eight miles west of the town on Beaver Creek. There, they lived with two other women, Sally Rice, who married Little Harp in the summer of 1797. Now, she was the daughter of John Price of Knoxville. And, well, in September of 1797, Big Harp married Susanna Roberts. But a Betsy Roberts also lived there. The two men shared all three women sexually. Okay, it's not known what happened to the Harp's captive women, but I can assume they were likely also murdered by these men. Now, Rod, I've got to mention this. You mentioned John Rice. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the Reverend John Rice. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too, the Reverend John Rice. So a man of God wow. let his daughter marry one of these things people. or did they or did they just play off like you know they were just as pure as the driven snow well i'm sure they're charming know. like a lot of serial killers are so yeah, yeah that's possible yeah, that's true well anyway the harps had been stealing pigs and other livestock and in 1798 a neighbor accused them of stealing his horses the harps ran off but the neighbors caught them and got the horses back but the man got away They returned to what newspapers of the day termed a rowdy groggery near town where they found the man who they thought had told the neighbor about them, a man named Johnson. They took Mr. Johnson and they killed him and dumped his body in the Holston River east of Knoxville with his guts ripped open and filled with stones. And uh, this method of executing somebody would become a trademark of the harps. Well, the men fled east to the Cumberland Gap to meet their three women. Traveling there on the Wilderness Road from Kingsport, Tennessee, they met a pair of Maryland travelers named Pekka and Bates and robbed and killed them. Then they robbed and killed a young Virginia man named Langford who showed off his silver coins to them. Probably not a very smart thing to do. The bodies were found a few days later. A local tavern keeper recognized them and figured the harps, well, they had to have done it. A posse was gathered, and they searched for the men. They caught them on, of all days, Christmas Day, 1798, and then they put them in jail in Stanford, Kentucky. After a preliminary hearing on January the 4th, they set a trial date, and they took them to Danville, Kentucky. There, they escaped the jail on March 16th, leaving the three women behind because they were pregnant and would slow them down. So the women were freed after a hearing in April, one acquitted, one mistrial, and one convicted, but the judge offered a new trial, and the DA declined, so she was eventually set free. And they all had their babies, each two months apart. In late March 1799, the Harps killed a man near the future site of Edmonton, then another on the Barren River eight miles below Bowling Green. On April 10th, they killed the 13-year-old son of Colonel Daniel Turbeau near Columbia, Kentucky. From there, they went to Cave and Rock in Henderson, Kentucky, Diamond Island, and Pot Spring, now Illinois. After the women were set free by the authorities back in Danville, they headed straight to Cave and Rock with the babies to be with the men. And on April 22nd, the Kentucky governor offered a $300 reward for the capture of the Harps. At about this same time in the west, along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, river pirates and outlaws were operating. The citizens of that region organized a militia to chase them out of the area, driving them to Illinois, where they welcomed the Harps as fellow outlaws. While in Illinois, Big Harp and Little Harp killed three or four other people. The first was killed near a place called Pot Spring, where they shot two or three people in cold blood by the fire where they had camped as they came upon them when they were headed to Caven Rock. While hiding out there, they joined the pirates in raids on flatboats. After one of these raids in May of 1799, they joined in a drunken celebration in the cave. And while the others were drunk, 
They took one of the survivors of the raid. They captured, tied him to a horse, stripped him naked, and then blindfolded the horse and ran it off a cliff into the rocks on the river below. These guys are sick. Oh, my gosh. The drunken pirates awakened from their stupor by the screams of the victim and dashed out just in time to see the horse and the victim run off the cliff and crash into the rocks below. They kicked the harps out along with their women and children. Yeah, not a bad idea considering it's ruining ruining the reputation of these pirates, so to speak. Yeah, that's pretty bad, ruining the reputation of a river pirate, yeah. Yeah. Well, by mid-July, the Harps had returned to East Tennessee, where they killed a farmer named Bradbury, 25 miles west of Knoxville, and a man named Hardin, three miles downstream on the Tennessee River. On July 22nd, they murdered the young son of Chesley Coffey on Black Oak Ridge, eight miles northwest of Knoxville, near present-day Oak Ridge. On July 24th, they killed William Ballard near Knoxville. On July 29th, they came across James and Robert Brassel on the road near Brassel's Knob, and they pretended to be posse members looking for the Harps, and they accused those two brothers of being them. Well, Robert managed to escape to get help, and they, well, while he was doing that, the Harps beat James to death. Turning north to Kentucky, they killed John Tully around the 1st of August in Clinton County, Then they killed John Graves and his son and the families and servants of the Triswold brothers who were all camped on the road to Adairville, Kentucky. Big Harp also killed one of their own children, either his or his brothers. We don't really know which. The party continued to Henderson County, Kentucky. They found a cabin on Canoe Creek and stayed there while the women traveled to find supplies. They then left to rejoin the women at the same time meeting up with a local man named James Tompkins. They told him they were itinerant preachers, so he invited them home to break bread, and they did so. He even told them he was out of powder for his gun, and the harps filled the gun with powder for him. Well, after leaving the Tompkins' home with no harm to him, a miracle in itself, they passed a local justice of the peace's house, but the guard dogs scared them away, and they moved on to the home of Moses Stiegel. His wife let them stay the night. Oh, my gosh. During the night of August 22nd, they murdered Mrs. Stiegel, the Stiegel's four-month-old child, and a Major William Love, who had also been allowed to stay the night as well. They then burned down the house, hoping to attract the attention of the Justice of the Peace. Hmm. Well, I guess they got his hmm. attention because the Justice... McB came, and with others, they formed a posse to, again, try to hunt down these vicious, vicious killers. They tracked them all down on August 23rd and again on August 24th, finding not them but the bodies of two more murdered men. Well, they did come upon the outlaws' camp with only Little Harp's wife there. Now, she pointed to where the men and the other two women had gone, and they chased after them, catching them after two miles. They called for Big Harp to surrender, causing him to take off, leaving the women behind, a real brave kind of fella. Four of the posse men shot at Big Harp, hitting him in the leg. John Leeper grabbed James Tompkins' gun, loaded with the powder that the Harps had given him, and took off on his horse after Big Harp. Harp, not realizing that Leeper got a fresh gun and thinking he hadn't had time to reload, stopped and aimed at him when Leeper fired and severed Harp's spinal cord. Wow. Now, Rod, in spite of this horrible wound, Harp took off again. No idea how he did that, but he did, bleeding horribly. The posse caught up with him and pulled him off his horse. He begged for water, and they filled his shoe with water and gave it to him. At this point, Realizing he was dying, Big Harp started confessing to all his killings, including the murders at Moses Stiegel's house. Upon hearing all this, Stiegel, who had been in this particular band of men that caught him, went Mm -hmm. into a rage. He pulled a butcher knife from Harp's saddlebag and slowly cut off the man's head. They then took the head to a fork in the road, one path going to Marion, and the other path to Russellville, and they hung it in a tree. The intersection was known for years as Harp's Head. 
Wow. Well, now we told you about what happened to Big Harp. Let's tell you what happened to Little Harp. He managed to escape that day and returned to the Pirates at Cave and Rock, where he stayed for four years. Then he and another pirate named May turned on the head pirate. Captain Mason killed him and cut his head off, taking it to the authorities for the reward money. Now, getting the money and turning to leave, someone in the crowd recognized and said, Hey, that's Little Harp, and the authorities arrested him. Well, they came in, they converged, and even though Harp and May escaped, a posse was soon formed once again, and they caught up to them, and they brought Little Harp in for good. And he was tried, sentenced, and hanged. Then their heads were cut off and placed on stakes along the Natchez Road as a warning to other outlaws. Wow. How about that Man. for a story, folks? <laughs> Now, Rod, I told Whoa. you these people were the most vicious serial killers I think we've ever had. I lost count of the number of people they yeah. killed. Yeah, I, I did too. I, I just lost track of this, but I, I just cannot believe it. You know, it's it's kind of sad that these guys both met their fate by having their heads cut off, mm -hmm. Big Harp and Little Harp both. But, you know, gosh, what they did in all this time – some people, you know, being selective, not doing anything to, but then beating a man to death, you know, going, cutting his innards, you know, letting his guts come out. I know the reason why to put stone in him until he'd sink to the bottom of the river. That yeah. was to get rid of him until nobody would find him. But, wow. I mean, but there are there are tales that I've heard about people that were, you know, very mean that one way that they did kill them and stuff was they cut their belly open, cut their belly open and let their guts hang out and, and – just to die that way and you know a lot of people did some people didn't though I, I know a story about one man that survived that uh even when the doctor said there's no way he'll be dead in a few a few days he ended up living another 50 or 60 years after that yeah so you know these things were they were cruel but you know life was cruel back in those days even up through the 1800s even into the 1900s things were really rough in appalachia yeah and, and I had never heard of these folks uh, until we did I research either, for so. this story. However, mm -hmm. I did find out later, and I don't know if I shared this with you or not, but Disney came along and sanitized one of the harps. Were you aware of that? Really? I did not know that. No. You need I to did go back at all. and look at some of these old 50s and 60s Disney movies. And I, it was either mm -hmm. the Daniel Boone movie, and I, I think that's what it was. I don't think it was Davy Crockett, but I think it was the Daniel Boone movie where they mentioned a river pirate named Harp. And, wow. and that, of course, Harp didn't, in Disney movies, didn't go around no. murdering a bunch of people, no. but he was just a, a river pirate that uh, I think it was Daniel Boone had all kinds of run ins with. Wow. Yeah. Mm. And, folks, that is the bloody story of the harps pioneer serial killers rapists and yeah terrorists another bit of the history of this place we call appalachia thanks for watching now again be sure to go down and click that subscribe button ding the bell and uh, if you like the podcast please give us a thumbs up and help us out a whole lot so until next we meet y'all take care so long everybody so long. <laughs> <laughs>